Okay. So greetings, everyone. Welcome to the Accounting Design Project virtual event. My name is Shiwan Song, and I will be the moderator for today. Today, we have the pleasure of learning about accounting for cryptocurrencies from Vivian Fang at the University of Minnesota. I thank you in advance for muting yourselves during the presentation. And I also encourage you to share your video so we can better enjoy your presence. For questions, please raise your hand by typing in the chat box or use the raise hand function so I can call participants in order. And finally, I would like to note that we will give Vivian five minutes of uninterrupted time at the beginning. So with that, Vivian, the floor is yours. All right, thank you so much, uh, Shiwan, and thanks very much for giving us a platform to present our work on crypto accounting and to collect feedback from a broad audience. The paper is titled Accounting for Cryptocurrencies and it is co-authored with uh, Chelsea Anderson and Jonathan Shipman at Arkansas and Robbie Moon at Georgia Tech. Just like the rules for crypto accounting are still underway, this paper is also very much work in progress so any comments or suggestions that you may have will be greatly appreciated. Now with a paper like this, um, it's probably worth spending some time giving an overview of the crypto assets and crypto markets and kind of just discussing where we stand with crypto regulation and accounting rule setting. So before we do that, I will also like to give a disclaimer. I am keenly aware that crypto is a controversial topic. And I'm more than happy to engage in conversations about the positive and the negative aspects of cryptocurrencies offline. But for today's talk, in the interest of time, I'll refrain from getting into debates about cryptocurrencies value or their foundational faith, because that would probably just distract us from discussing the issues at hand. The specific challenge we take on with this paper is how to objectively report the facts about corporate involvement in the crypto space and the prevailing accounting and disclosure practices and how to present and package our findings so they can be more useful and informative to standard setters and other interested parties. And we believe this is a worthwhile exercise because corporate interest in crypto assets does appear to be growing despite all the controversy about cryptocurrencies and because crypto accounting is very much a current topic on the fast fees recognition and the measurement agenda and the board's decision is highly anticipated. Now starting with the basics, what is cryptocurrency? This is a simple definition I like to go by. Cryptocurrencies are digital, decentralized currencies that rely on cryptography for security and blockchain for bookkeeping. Now, Bitcoin, the first and also the most prominent cryptocurrency, was born in the wake of the 2007 to 2008 financial crisis when some people began to lose faith in the traditional financial system and really started questioning the role that central banks and major financial institutions played in driving up the crisis. For that reason, Bitcoin was designed to be very different from fiat currencies like US dollars because it was supposed to circumvent centralized control of money. And I'll highlight two aspects here. First, Bitcoin is not backed by any government and its issuance is not managed by any central bank. Instead, it's governed by a decentralized community and its issuance is rigidly set by an open source protocol that is visible to all. Second, Bitcoin transactions are also not maintained by any central authority. Instead, they're just posted on this distributed ledger commonly referred to as blockchain by competing computer nodes. And the records on the Bitcoin blockchain are accessible by the public. They're traceable at real time and immutable. Now the size of the crypto market stayed relatively modest before 2017. As you can see, it's relatively flat before 2017. Right, we had a bit of rise then came back down into from 2017 to 2018. Then it grew exponentially during the COVID-19 pandemic, reaching a peak of $3 trillion in November, 2021. 
although crypto market value kind of declined along with other assets in 2022, there are still about 22,000 types of cryptocurrencies and tokens traded with a total market value of over uh, $1 trillion today. Now, during the formative years of crypto markets, we see participation mostly by three niche groups, including the creators and the original investors. We see true believers of decentralization like cypherpunks. And these are people who advocate for social and policy changes through the proactive use of cryptography. And we also see speculators and the market did attract occasional institutional and corporate interest from companies like Digital Currency Group, Overstock, and Microsoft. But in general, mainstream investors kind of just dismissed crypto assets as speculative vehicles that just lack investment value. Starting in 2020, things have really changed. We see a growing number of institutions and corporate investors beginning to allocate a percentage of their portfolios to crypto assets. Now, it is hard to ascertain the exact reasons behind this rising interest, but a combination of factors likely contributed. First, cryptocurrencies are increasingly accepted as a mode of payment online and offline in both developed and emerging markets. Now, many of these everyday stores that you're familiar with, like Starbucks, Whole Foods and Home Depot have figured out a way to accept crypto payments and mostly through the uh, third party app providers. And whether you care for cryptocurrencies or not, I think we can pretty much agree that digital currencies and cashless payments are irreversible trends in the future. Second, cryptocurrencies are becoming an accepted investment vehicle to store value. It is likely that the COVID-19 pandemic led to more people spending time and money in the virtual space. And the Fed's policy responses to the pandemic at the very beginning, like slashing interest rates to zero and injecting abundant liquidity to the economy may have fundamentally altered people's perception towards cryptocurrencies. I have another working paper on crypto with Stephanie Dong, a PhD student at NYU, and Wang Wei Ling, a PhD student in Minnesota, shows that the Fed's quantitative easing measures implemented at the beginning of the pandemic really raised institutional investors' risk appetite and drove them to assets like cryptocurrencies to seek higher returns from riskier investments. So interestingly, institutional investors are increasingly becoming the dominant players in the crypto markets. Now, you may be wondering, what well, was the Fed working to reverse course by increasing interest rates? Would such interest just disappear? At least for now, that is not what we see. Despite the steep downturn in the crypto markets and several high profile collapses of crypto firms recently, like the FTX exchange, as you probably all read about from the media coverage, corporate and institutional interest in crypto remains very strong as shown by all of these industry and uh, reports and surveys. And many banks, brokers and hedge funds have quietly launched their own digital asset units and products. Compared to the growth of the market and mainstreaming interest, regulation has quite a bit of catching up to do. In the United States, the regulatory discussion kind of centers around what asset class best, fit, best fits crypto assets and which federal agency has jurisdiction to oversee them. Now, the Treasury Department kind of views crypto either as replacements of or threats to the fiat currencies like US dollars. And the SEC consider most of the securities and the CFTC views leading cryptocurrencies as commodities. Now, the recent debate about the spot versus future Bitcoin ETFs, which you may also read about, really highlights the regulatory ambiguity over crypto assets because a future ETF 
only needs the CFTC to continue regulating Bitcoin future contracts as derivatives, which it had been doing since 2017. But a spot ETF would require the SEC to take a much clearer stance on whether Bitcoin should be considered a security or not, which the agency has been hesitant to do. Additionally, we see this very recently introduced uh, DCCPA bill, uh, the so-called DeFi killer bill. And this bill, if passed, would grant the CFTC more direct control over the crypto industry. So to address these type of issues and bring in more regulatory clarity, President Joe Biden signed an executive order in March 2022 that directed federal agencies to coordinate their efforts to draft crypto regulation. And in September 2022, the White House released its first ever regulatory framework for digital assets, which kind of paved the way for further policies but we still have a lot of work to do in terms of regulation. Now, focusing on external reporting, which is also more relevant to us and to this paper, US GAAP currently offers no authoritative guidance or rules that specifically address the accounting or disclosure for investment in crypto. In fact, on three separate occasions, the FASB rejected requests to set accounting rules for digital assets, citing that they're just not pervasive enough to warrant explicit guidance. Now, in the absence of definitive rules, the big four accounting firms kind of come in and, and together with AICPA, they issued non-authoritative guidance between 2018 and 2019 which suggested that in the current framework, corporate crypto holdings best fit the definition of indefinite lived intangible assets for the lack of physical substance. And to us, we know that that just means that the accounting for crypto assets should follow SC350 on intangibles, goodwill, and other. However, all parties acknowledge that the accounting treatment recommended by this guidance is not ideal. I see one question from the audience. Would you like me to take it? Um, I, I, I wasn't sure whether this was a question. Oh, okay. Yes. Yeah, okay. Um, I, I don't, I think it's just a comment. Yeah. Anyway, uh, the tricky part uh, is cryptocurrencies arguably fit the definition of assets because they can carry probable future economic benefits. So reporting entities should provide information about crypto holdings that is useful for decision-making and the found space conceptual framework. <laughs> However- I think Brett has a question. Yep. Yeah, can I jump in here, Vivian? Of course. How are you doing today? Good, how are you? I just wanted to get your thoughts, Vivian, because you probably thought about this a lot more than I have, is how much this non-authoritative guidance that came out from the firms, how much of this do you think was that the definition of crypto didn't really fit with any of the other nice definitions within US GAAP. So it just, it was more like a default decision yes. versus that was a kind of an intentional classification. Exactly. They basically looked at all the codified assets, right? I think we have all agree that cryptocurrencies are different from any existing or codified assets we've seen before. So the big four accounting firms, they had a practice so they didn't have any authoritative guidance to work with and firms came to them asking for their guidance on how to account for assets on their balance sheet and income statement. So big four accounting firms kind of just, intangible assets were their last resort and they could justify it because crypto assets have no physical substance. So that's the last resort exactly as you conject it and it was just by default. And they, even when they were issuing the guidance, they acknowledged that this accounting treatment is probably not ideal. So over the years, accounting firms, the big four accounting firms and AICPA were pushing the FASB to make a decision. Uh, but you know, in, in the past, FASB was also hesitant to come up with explicit guidance because I think part of the thinking is just Maybe this is not big enough. We can just let, wait to, for it. Maybe it will just quietly die down. 
um, or maybe we'll let SEC to <laughs> take the lead and recognize as security, which will give us more room to work with. But now we're kind of at a point that um, we have to, which I'll explain a little bit why we are at the crossroads. So the tricky part, just as Brett pointed out, is cryptocurrencies arguably fit the definition of assets, right? which means that reporting entities should provide information about crypto holdings that is useful for decision making. At least that's what FASB's conceptual framework said. However, the- um, I know has a question. Yeah. Hi, Vivian. Uh, yeah, hi. My question is actually before this accounting, I'm still thinking about when you talk about the technology, Regulation. the blockchain behind, uh, oh. yeah. And then my question is more related to, uh, yeah, one slide before. Yeah, oh. decentralized. So is there any assurance or audit on this decentralized open, open kind of like ledgers, right? Uh, I understand the concept of transparency and decentralization, but if no human beings actually checking what's being stored up there, maybe they're just junks that not even relevant commercial information related to the transaction we want to store. So is there, can you touch on any kind of like verification uh, on, on this process? Um, yes. So yeah. the, the, there are a couple of issues here, right? Like the concept of blockchain and auditing on the chain is, is attractive, right? It's intuitively attractive because we have all these records appended to the chain in a chronological order and nobody could expose to go in and alter that data. So that aspect is very attractive, but one thing just as you point out that the blockchain has to interact with uh, data and source from the outside world. And the, the computer nodes that are responsible for uploading the data and the records to the chain, we refer to them as oracles. So if oracles are, you know, the integrity is compromised and the data uploaded the chain is compromised, we still have a problem, right? Then garbage in, garbage out. And also, we don't see a lot of blockchain-based auditing, even though the idea is very intuitive. The problem is that this infrastructure can be really costly. And when you want to launch a blockchain-based auditing, we need a consortium of participants. And the question comes down to, oh, maybe you can create social welfare. And everybody agrees that if we have an infrastructure in place that makes auditing easier, that's great. But who is going to pay for that? So, you know, about two weeks ago, I gave another lecture on the governance implications of this. I talked about this. When it comes to enterprise applications, cost is important aspect. We have to think about whether the benefits created by the infrastructure can justify the cost or not. But yeah, so your point is very valid. Um, even though that the technology ensures that the data uploaded to the chain are uh, you know, immutable and auditable, but it still remains question um, as to what data has been uploaded to the chain and how can we make use of that. Okay, I think we have some additional questions, Steve. Yep. Uh, yeah, so I just have a quick question. Uh, so given you mentioned that a lot of people don't quite know what the proper accounting for these are and that mm -hmm they don't seem to fit the mold of intangibles. Mm -hmm. Do any companies voluntarily report them in a different way? So for example, treat them as financial securities, mark to market, mark them to market, and then show what the balance sheet and income statement would have looked like? That's a great question. And that's part of the motivation of this paper. Now, before the not authoritative guidance issued by the big four accounting firms, we actually see, right, this is kind of a preview of the results. We actually see most firms going with the fair value accounting. Mm -hmm. uh, after this not authoritative guidance, because, the, you know, this is not mandatory, we still see the reporting practices being all over the place. Mm -hmm. uh, some firms had a switch from fair value accounting to intangible asset accounting, but they would supplement that accounting recognition with voluntary disclosure of the fair value okay. inputs. <laughs> Even within the fair value, voluntary disclosure is all over the place. And some firms would give very detailed inputs like quantities and price and lots, which is very transparent and you can mm -hmm. back it out. But some firm would just give you one value. 
And on top of that, the fair value basis for crypto assets, it's not as clear cut as stock basis, right? With stock, we can just go on exchange, it's nationally recognized, but with with some of these, particularly the obscure crypto assets, the fair value basis is a very elusive concept. And we can talk more about that when we get to the policy implications. Okay, okay, thanks. Thank I you. guess I should have read the paper. Thank you. Oh, thanks. no, no. It's it's my job <laughs> to explain. Yeah. No, but thank okay, you. Thank you, Vivian. We'll take the next question from Charles. Sure. Hey, Vivian. I'm uh, just following up on um, Brett's question and, and partly Steve's. Mm -hmm. uh, this idea that the classification into intangible assets, you know, we kind of backed into this, which might from which we might infer that there's nothing, no economic statement being made. I wonder if that's going a little bit too far. Because mm -hmm. if we think about the, if it's a identifiable non-monetary asset without physical substance, the non-monetary part of the definition, that there's something economic here, right, being expressed. And this is a big part of the discussion that folks, economists were having. You mean, whether or not this is money. You mean, so I, I guess the, are you asking about the logic of the big four accounting firms? giving this non-authoritative guidance, recommending the use of intangible assets. Yeah, exactly. And what I read, yeah. um, I, I agree that the, the, the discussion between the intangible asset, well, the, 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 the discussion about the intangible asset versus fair value accounting really comes down to book value recognition versus historical accounting recognition versus fair value accounting recognition, right? We, and we had this discussion about the mortgage-backed securities and some of these derivatives backed uh, in the, when, when we had the 2007, 2008 financial crisis. So yes, there are a lot of econ economic debates going into this about which uh, accounting recognition method would give us more informative measurement. Um, but I did not quite see that discussion coming up, at least based on the not authoritative interpretations issued by the big four accounting firms. They described the difficulties of fitting cryptocurrencies into any codified asset category. Um, for example, they say, you know, uh, with fiat currencies, they function similarly to fiat currencies as a medium of exchange and a store of value, but cryptocurrencies, they don't have the governmental or commodity backing necessary to be considered cash. And cash usually requires that, right? And also cryptocurrencies, they do not have a stated maturity and they're too volatile to be considered cash equivalents. So equating them with treasury bills, for example, some of these short-term cash equivalents is really tricky too. And they entitle holding entities to economic benefits um, but unlike stock, they don't attach any ownership interest. Some of the utility tokens do, um, but open source cryptocurrency projects like Bitcoin, they don't have ownership interest. They don't have contractual rights like bonds. So they don't have these uh, traditionally contracted terms that are necessary for them to be considered financial instruments. So these discussion did come up in the interpretations. They highlight the challenges of why they don't really fit any of the existing assets. Um, but when it comes to the recommendation, um, they, it, the discussion becomes very thin and just says that, you know, uh, we think that for now it fits the best with the intangible assets. But it seems that. But it seems that the yeah. economists were were mostly arguing that this is not money because it doesn't fit. There, there is no store of value here given the volatility. And so in that sense, you could say this is not money and it has no physical substance. And so just classifying what kind of asset it is, it does seem to fit the intangible asset definition. I can push back a little bit on that, the store of value aspect, right? For one, the Bitcoin volatility had dropped significantly. I think in Q3 of 2022, that was the first quarter that Bitcoin's volatility was much lower than SP500 and also outperformed Bitcoin. I mean, SP500, but we can leave that discussion to another time. Um, the store of value and medium exchange too. These two basic functions of Bitcoin have been highly debated. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Vivian. The next question is from Vicky. Oh, hi, Vivian. Hey, Vicky. Yeah. 
Uh, my question is actually kind of related to Charles, but let me ask it in a more conceptual way, right? I yes. think one of the biggest problem for accounting for cryptocurrency is really this, uh, I think, uh, dif differences on understanding of whether cryptocurrency satisfies the, the definition of virtual money, right? So that's mm -hmm. kind of three ways and all that. And I think in U.S., things are gets even more complicated because different regulators actually regard this uh, cryptocurrency different like is think it's a property right and uh, uh future commissions think it's like commodity and then sec really want to classify some of that security so i think it will be really really difficult to giving all these differences in the underlying kind of understanding of the, the definition of it versus the regulatory stance to come up with the accounting kind of standard so i'm just wondering how are you going to overcome all those complexity in the underlying kind of uh, concept of cryptocurrency. Oh, we're not. That's definitely not the challenge we take on with this paper. Uh, sure. We are more, we at least the goal of this paper, my, what my co-authors and I are trying to do here is to describe the status quo. You're absolutely right, right? Uh, it, the debate is not just about cryptocurrency versus money, it's whether it fits in any commodity or security. What we're trying to do here is more of a summarize the views expressed by different regulatory agencies and where we stand with the accounting rule setting development. And uh, we're actually trying to refrain from expressing our own views on where crypto assets would fit. Yeah, but that's, I think, one of the kind of the catch 22 for this project is right because I mean accounting is really account for underlying economics right so like based on your understanding of the underlying e economics it's a different accounting treatment so I felt like uh, you know you're probably in a difficult uh, position in 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 this paper as a context to you know I understand you try to get away from that but you know without that I felt like without that stance I felt like it's really difficult to kind of make a uh, kind of take away from, you know, this project. That's just my... I mean, we do offer a little bit beyond just the factual reporting of what's going on right now. Uh, one thing I think right now, right, like, so we face, that is one, what you highlight is one challenge that we face. What exactly are cryptocurrencies and how should we view them? The second challenge we face is that we don't have a proposal we are currently we can currently comment on what we're working with is that fastb right let me just finish this the latest developments are the fastb reported reportedly reached a tentative decision that will require fair value accounting for covered crypto holdings but we haven't seen that proposal yet which is said to be released by the end of march then this proposal is allegedly will be used as a basis to build the first explicit accounting stand on crypto assets in the United States. So we're working with a lot of reporting about what FASB is going to do, but we haven't seen the specific proposal or the proposed accounting standard yet. Now the paper, what we can say is that we think that the idea of using fair value of accounting for crypto assets is very attractive, but at the same time, it faces multiple challenges. And one of the goal of this paper is to highlight some of the challenges. Um, we're not getting into the weeds about the commodities versus securities or money and the different aspects of cryptocurrencies, because I think that there are aspects of cryptocurrencies that kind of make them resemble all of these instruments. But by the end of the day, you may call for a different, entirely different codified asset just to fit the crypto assets on its own. Okay, thank you, Vivian. Um, the next question from Oliver. Yeah, hey Vivian, just um, just kind of following up on the discussion. So yeah. it seems like you're kind of presenting this as, I mean, basically it seems like the discussion, how you've portrayed it was basically historical cost accounting versus fair value accounting, as you mentioned earlier. I was a bit surprised about that because, I mean, to be like the most natural accounting treatment with respect to crypto would be basically to avoid recognition and just disclose it, right? Because if you think about the definition of an asset, I mean, the future benefit has to be measured with a certain reliability, right? And 
I think, as you have argued before, and as I would argue, it's like really difficult to reliably measure the future benefit of the crypto asset here, which would kind of push more towards disclosure. And I guess my question is like, how prevalent has this view been? Is that something that people just disregard? Everyone kind of agrees that, oh, we need to recognize it on the financial statements, or is there also a push on the side to forward disclosure rather than recognition? Well, that's a great question. And I think that question kind of goes beyond this paper and goes even beyond cryptocurrencies, right? Your question is really about the importance of recognition given sufficient disclosure. Um, the, the thing is that I think in practice, at least you know, based on my conversation with practitioners, that disclosure is not enough. Think about credit rating agents, I mean, it's analysts. They need the recognized amount on the balance sheet to work with when they issue their credit ratings, evaluated firms' uh, credit ratings and the credit standings. So they need a concrete number to work with. And it's not realistic for these analysts who work with a large amount of firms just to figure out every, you know, read through the disclosure and figure out the exact amount themselves. So I think that in terms of debt contracting and in terms of some of the things that industry and equity analysts and credit analysts have to do, they need the recognized amount on the balance sheet and other financial statements to work with. Does that answer your question? I mean, I'm not, I'm not sure. I mean, like, think about like a technology firm, right? I mean, when they invest in R&D, I mean, that's also investment. And I mean, frankly, that's why oh, yeah. most of the capital providers would give them that, but we don't recognize it anyways, right? So you can, I mean, I think they kind of have a bit more storytelling, right? Or a bit more right. disclosure. So I'm not sure whether I would agree with the statement that recognition is necessary, even in terms of credit agreements. I agree it would make things probably a bit more com a bit more complicated but i think that's uh, kind of a uh, nature of that ad of that asset yes. if it were one yes so going with one way to recognize crypto assets on the balance sheet does not necessarily make it right with right being right here is also being a very elusive right um but it definitely makes some uh -huh. practitioners job a little easier which is why they're pushing for the fasb to give them authoritative guidance that they can recognize a specific number of the yeah. crypto holdings on balance sheet and compare yeah. them across firms. Yeah, no, I understand. I guess my question is more broadly, like whether this perspective has been in discussion at all or whether everyone just kind of agrees, oh, we need like some number, even though it might be completely wrong. Like maybe it's not measuring the economic reality at all. Just give us a number so that we can write a, credit contract. I mean, I'm frankly surprised to hear that, uh, but I, if that's I, a perspective, then that's interesting. Thank you. Right. I think that the uh, what, we're, what we're working here is that given that we need to recognize a number, right? given that we need to have a measurement of crypto assets on the balance sheet, which methodology may be the lesser of the two evils? understanding that there are pros and cons to the historical value accounting versus uh, fair value accounting. And I am very eager to see this proposal that is about to be released by the FASB because they do say that, you know, they're leaning towards fair value accounting, but they also aim at reflecting the underlying economics of Bitcoin and other tokenized assets. So hopefully they'll provide some rationale to go with fair value accounting. Right. Um, yeah. And, and, you know, just as a side note, the FASB did mention that the public will have 75 days to comment on this proposal before they publicly release it at the end of March. So, you know, if you're interested, send them a comment and I think that it will be warmly received. Okay, great discussion. Thank you, Vivian. Um, Vicky, do you have an additional question? Okay, so I think we can move on. Sorry, I forgot to lower my hand. Okay, let me do. 
All right, so with the rise of corporate crypto holdings, the limitation of the prevailing accounting treatment has become increasingly evident. For example, MicroStrategy, right, which is known to hold a large quantity of Bitcoin, disclosed an impairment loss of uh, roughly $200 million on its $1.9 billion worth of Bitcoin holdings in its um, 2021 Q1 10 Q filings. And the firm also disclosed sufficient inputs to calculate a total fair value of $5.1 billion for these holdings, or 2.7 times the balance sheet value. In this case, the use of intangible asset accounting accompanied by fair value disclosure kind of sends ambiguous signals to financial statement users, as the disclosure of impairment loss seems to be at odds with significant market appreciation in the same period. And a similar issue is observed for Square. Now, the limitations of intangible asset for crypto becomes even more salient when firms provide no fair value inputs, because at the moment, this disclosure is entirely left to firms' discretion. Okay, now this is kind of where we stand. We are kind of at the crossroads, such that on one side, we are seeing growth of the crypto market and mainstream interest. And on the other side, we're also feeling the problems due to a lack of regulation and a lack of accounting guidance. So perhaps it's time to play catch up. And we hope this paper um, documents some interesting findings that can contribute to the discussion. Now, what do we do in this paper? We seek to write one of the first papers on crypto accounting and document the progression of crypto accounting, both in terms of reporting and disclosure for US public entities. Our goal is to inform standard setters in three primary ways. First, we examine whether corporate crypto holdings are pervasive to warrant rule setting efforts by outlining the landscape, uh, landscape of such holdings disclosed by US firms. Second, we document the status quo of corporate crypto accounting by summarizing the variety of reporting and disclosure choices made by US firms in practice. And we also try to shed light on whether liquidity plays a role in firms fair value reporting and disclosure choices. In terms of the specific research objectives, we first examine how prevalent corporate crypto holdings are in the United States and what factors give rise to changes in crypto holdings. We then examine the accounting methodology and disclosure practices used to account for and disclose corporate crypto holdings in practice and how they have changed over time. Finally, we ask a very specific question as to whether the liquidity of crypto assets plays a role in a firm's decision to adopt fair value accounting or make fair value discussion, I mean, disclosures for crypto assets. We begin by identifying a sample of US firms with crypto holdings disclosed in periodic financial reports filed with the SEC. To do so, we first searched for crypto related keywords and we came up with these keywords. And if you think we missed any, feel free to send us an email. So we search for these keywords within the footnotes of financial statements included in quarterly filings, as our initial screening reveals that firms with crypto involvement almost always disclose and discuss their holdings, if any, in, in financial statement footnotes. And if there is at least one footnote containing a match keyword, we then read the entire report to manually extract and categorize information about the reporting and disclosure choices that the firm makes in its crypto accounting. And the resulting sample contains 438 firm quarter observations for reporting periods ending between December 31st, 2013 to December 31st, 2021. Okay, now let's look at some data. Yeah. Sorry, I just have a question about your sample yeah. 80, 98 firms. Do you know how many of them are financial institutions? Not many of them. So we do have, um, so we didn't do that cut. We do have a plot for holding objectives. 
So if the firms are accepting them, if the mining firms, we know what they do. And if they hold them um, as a result of accepting them as a payment, and they are usually not financial institutions. There is one firm, um, which is a grayscale. Some of the investment vehicles are held by the digital currency group. And that is a big portion of our sample. So we separate the holdings held by Grayscale Trust with all the other firms. Uh, okay. so, so we do know reason, there's one yeah. financial firm that is significantly driving the sample, but even setting that aside, we see an upward trend. So would you say that most of them are not financial institutions and then in terms their of purpose numbers? Was and yes, their purpose would be them. like um, speculative purpose or because it's hard to believe that uh, for a non-financial firm holding those currencies are going to help their core operations, right? Uh, uh, that is that correct. And some firms do um, disclose when they make sizable investment in crypto assets. For example, Tesla. When Tesla bought into Bitcoin, it says that we're just trying to more wisely manage our cash holdings. So at least at that time, they believed that by putting parking their cash in Bitcoin would provide them a better return than parking them in treasury bill and other short-term uh, cash equivalents. Yeah, so sometimes these firms do disclose why they hold a significant amount of Bitcoin. And in micro strategy, the way I see it, the firm basically become a Bitcoin venture capital. Uh, so that one is, the firm is, the firm performance is closely tied to the crypto market now. So it really depends on which firm we're talking about. And Square, right? Square is, uh, is, is a financial firm, but that investing cryptocurrency is not just what Square does. Square is a payment company. So you hold some of the cryptos uh, as a result of accepting as a payment, uh, other transactions, crypto related transactions it engages in, but it's also not, it, the, the firm's performance does not critically depend on cryptos. So uh, another kind of follow up question is that, do you think that accounting for cryptocurrency will really differ between financial institutions who actually focus on asset liability matching and diversification effects versus a uh, non-financial, that potentially we are looking for two different treatments depending on the firm's kind of core operations nature, right? So again, that depends. If we're talking about an investment company, like digital currency group, like all the grayscale trusts, they are already recognizing all the crypto holdings at fair value because that's what they do, right? It's an investment company, they trade frequently. Um, if we're talking about a financial firm like Square that this is not solely what they do, they mostly provide payments. They happen to hold some cryptos as a result of their call operations. Um, they tend to recognize them as intangible assets right now, which could change after the fan speech, you know, uh, finalize the proposal and recommend the use of fair value accounting. Okay, now let's look at some data. So this figure illustrates the growth in corporate holdings of crypto assets over time. And the green line on the top represents the fair value of a grayscale trust. And as the investment companies, grayscale account for their crypto holdings uh, as at fair value already, following SC 946 financial service investment companies. And the blue line at the bottom represents the book value of other corporate crypto holdings. And the orange line in the middle represents the fair value of other corporate crypto holdings, which is infirmed. And we do our best job to infer the fair value based on the disclosed inputs or values, but it is not always obtainable because sometimes firms just do not disclose that. So the aggregate value of corporate crypto holdings, which combines the green line and the orange line as disclosed in their SEC filings, started around $16.4 million in Q4 of 2013 and stayed relatively flat and averaged to be $25 million between the Q4 of 2013 and the Q3 of 2019 and really jumped uh, in, in Q4 to 2021 to five, uh, five, $54 billion. Now, as you probably noticed, right, the crypto holdings captured by our sample are 
modest, um, but they represent, we believe that they represent a lower bound of the true corporate crypto holdings for these three reasons. First, right, just looking at Grayscale. Grayscale manages 17 crypto investment vehicles, and our sample is only able to include six from the time they were required to file with SEC because Grayscale is now required to file all of their crypto-related investment products with the SEC. Second, we're only able to include the quarter and fair value of a firm's crypto holdings if one is actually given in the SEC filings or can be reasonably inferred based on the disclosed information. Otherwise, we're constrained to use just the quarter and carrying value, which may only be a fraction of the fair value given the average rising crypto, pri uh, crypto prices during our sample period. And another constraint is that our observations are limited to firms that explicitly disclose the information about their crypto holdings in their SEC filings, which may change with the new disclosure rules. For example, PayPal. Right? PayPal allows its customers to buy, sell, and hold crypto through its platform, and it's very easy to buy to trade crypto using the PayPal platform. But PayPal is not included in our sample at all. And we read through their SEC filings and there's no mentioning of crypto holdings until 2022 uh, when the SEC issued the staff accounting board uh, number 21, 121, the SAP 121, now requires registrants to recognize custodian, custodianized digital assets, both as assets and liabilities on their balance sheets. So we believe that these estimates reported by this paper do represent a lower bound. And the numbers reported in this table kind of confirm the trend that we see in the plot. Any way you look at it, cover holdings of crypto assets are on the rise. Consistent with the figure, the book value and the inferred fair value are relatively consistent for much of the period prior to 2019. However, we do see a growing divergence between the two starting 2019, which peaked at an inferred fair value that is on average 1.6 times that of the book value by the end of our sample period. And consistent with the plot, the book value and the inferred fair value are relatively consistent for much of the period prior to 2019. Okay, now to better understand the driving forces of the growth in reported crypto holdings, what we do next is to try to decompose the trend into its primary determinants. And here we report the inferred fair value in blue line and the average crypto prices as proxied by the price of Bitcoin, the inferred quantities held and the number of firms in our sample for each calendar quarter of the sample period. Because one comment we got, right, when we were presenting just the trend in the corporate holdings of crypto assets is that, is this solely driven by the price of the crypto which jumped during the pandemic? While there has been a significant increase in crypto prices, particularly towards the end of our sample period, we actually find that the quantities held, as well as the number of firms holding crypto assets, also explain a significant portion of the increasing trend. So in our tabulated analysis, we find that the increase in the value of reported crypto holdings is driven by the increase in crypto prices, which explains about 92%, Increase in quantities held, which includes uh, explains about 88%, and increase in number of firms with holdings, uh, which explains 72% based on the partial R square uh, in that order. Okay, Oliver has another question. Sure. Uh, just following up on that plot, Vivian. I mean, so I think what would be very interesting to see here is if you kind of collect data now for the last year, right? Because you kind of stop the sample here at basically. Christmas time for cryptos yes. and uh, the question then kind of becomes okay what has happened since then with the value crashing and with many companies publicly announcing that they're going to get out of it right so to kind of uh, provide a bit of perspective because if we just look at this year where we are of course at the all-time right. high so far then what what is really happening now after right so definitely yeah yeah so, I mean, in terms of the components, right, one thing we already know is that the price crashed during 2022, right? My, the paper is currently under review, and we fully 
plan to extend the sample given the chance. Um, that I think that the number of companies with holdings, my guess is that it hasn't dropped significantly, but we we you know we should definitely explore that. Um, so this table provides the details of these three factors over time. And again, we find that these factors are highly positively correlated with each other with the increase in crypto prices likely enticing corporations to enter the crypto market and increase their holdings over time. And just as Oliver said, it would be interesting to see when the price goes down and what changes with respect to these three factors. Um, corporate crypto holdings are becoming not only more pervasive, but also increasingly material. For our sample, the median crypto holdings to assets ratio uh, based on the carrying values reported balance sheet increased from 0.9% in 2013 to 7.4% in 2021. And the median percentage of quarterly profits losses in absolute value uh, increased from 2.5% in 2013 to 5.4% in 2021. And you may notice a dip in 2019 here, right? And that is because that we have entrance of the larger, older, and more established firms entering the crypto market. So as a result, materiality begins to drop, right? Dropped a little bit because for these firms that even though they're, the absolute value of their crypto holdings is sizable, uh, the materiality is very low. We also observe significant diversification in the reported holding objectives, and firms may hold crypto as a result of conducting transactions, as a result of accepting them as payments, investing, mining, or raising capital through ICO, with transaction and mining based being the most common objectives before and after 2017, and they stand at 65 and 45 percent, respectively. Okay. We'll go a little faster here. We'll continue our analysis of covered crypto holdings by examining the accounting and disclosure choices made by firms in our sample, which we summarize in this figure. For the first five years of the sample period, firms tended to account for crypto holdings at fair value, consistent with the accounting for cash and cash equivalents and foreign currency. But in the latter half of 2018, right, we see a significantly drop, a shift from fair value to uh, intangible asset accounting, which coincided with the interpretative guidance published by the big four accounting firms and AICPA. So there is a slight increase here uh, in the usage of fair value to account for crypto holdings in 2020, which is largely driven by firms holding such assets for the purpose of speculative investing. Okay, Oliver? Yeah. Just a just a quick question. Um, again, like you had like a really interesting thought, I think, before, you know, like with your objectives. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering, you know, do you see any firms who really disclose like why they actually hold it. I mean, for example, do you see like the composition of the crypto assets as kind of percentage of in particular, whether they got it out of transactions? I think that would be a very nice piece of evidence if we it were would, available, but maybe yes, they are not disclosing it. Yes, we would love to have that level of details. We just don't. And a part of that is endogenous because there are no disclosure rules, right? And is it entirely up to the firm what they would like to disclose or disclose at all? Um, so yeah, that, that is a challenge. And as academics, I would love to have as much data as possible. Yeah. We just don't but have they don't that. disclose it basically that how much they got out of transactions. They just disclose yeah. whether that's what they want. Okay, yeah, gotcha. and Thanks. even for fair value disclosure, some just give you a number. You have no idea where the number is from and which date that number is based and which exchange they got it from. So is it, there are a lot of you know, chaotic um, practices that we're currently observing in this space. So this paper, um, this table kind of provides additional detail on these accounting choices, right? The column one and two just replicate, um, just provides the specifics for the data we use in the plot you've already seen. And the last two columns here shed light on the choices related to accounting for crypto holdings as intangible assets. So when the use of intangible asset accounting was relatively less common before 2019, the impairment trigger was universally disclosed. 
However, when firms start shifting to this accounting method and you know, move away uh, from fair value accounting, we observe a significant decrease in the number of firms disclosing the impairment trigger that they use, which is really interesting. And for accountants, right, we know that from prior literature, the opacity resulting from a decrease in disclosure could create opportunities for firms to manage earnings. Now, firms using intangible asset accounting for crypto holdings also exercise considerable discretion in the amount of information they choose to disclose with respect to fair value of their holdings. And this figure kind of details trends in the voluntary disclosure of fair value information for our sample. In the first half of our sample period, voluntary disclosure of fair value information was relatively infrequent, mostly due to the lack of firms using intangible asset accounting. We observe an increase in from disclosing either the fair value of their holdings or the inputs to determine fair value to supplement the intangible asset disclosure within their quarterly report starting in 2019, which coincided with a period that saw a significant increase in crypto prices. And I'm going to skip this table. Okay. So the third okay, step. Well, Vivian, process, you have five minutes left. Just wanted yeah, to remember. I'm going to go into the bathroom. Plays a role in the mm -hmm. firm's decision to adopt a fair value of accounting. And we focus on liquidity because we can draw the motivation from the fair value accounting theory that says that liquidity is really important, is a defining characteristic of, uh, and, and is also a defining characteristic of crypto assets. And the importance of liquidity is also recognized in practice. Um, we consider how crypto market liquidity affects both the choice of accounting policy and the extent of voluntary fair value disclosure. The takeaway of the next two analysis is that firms are more likely to apply fair value accounting to crypto holdings when the reported period of liquidity of crypto markets is higher. And not surprisingly, this evidence is limited to pre-guidance period when firms are kind of left unguided. But after the big four accounting firms and AICPA kind of guided the firms towards the intangible asset, they are more likely to make voluntary fair value disclosure when the reporting period liquidity of crypto markets is higher. So combined, we believe these two results are consistent with theory and suggest that liquidity plays a role in crypto related accounting and disclosure choices. Okay, to wrap it up, um, this is, to our best knowledge, this is the only the other paper in this space um, that looks at crypto accounting. There is another concurrent paper by Luo and Yu, which analyzed the annual findings of 40 global firms in one year, single year 2020, with no exposure to cryptocurrencies to illustrate how firms' crypto accounting practices differ between IFAS and US GAAP. So our study does differ from their study because we look at a long time series from 2013 to 2021. And we collect all of the firms to quantify the entire corporate holdings landscape in the United States and to study both the progression of and the basis for the accounting and disclosure choices related to these holdings and US gap. And we can also contributed to the literature on the recognition the literature on financial statement comparability and the literature, of course, on crypto. Um, in terms of policy implications, we think that the corporate holdings of crypto assets are undoubtedly rising in the US, which helps justify the regulatory efforts of coming up with accounting guidance. We do find significant manager discretion in accounting for crypto holdings, and liquidity appears to be important consideration in the choice of fair value accounting versus historical accounting in the crypto setting. And there are some, the devil is in the details. Now we know the FASB is leaning towards fair value accounting. For example, the, the FASB, we, not, we don't know what they're going to do with non-fungible tokens, the value of which is um, very subjective. For example, right, um, this uh, Ryan 
and the, uh, this Leon cat was sold for six hundred thousand dollars, and this piece of art was sold for sixty-nine million dollars. Right, so that is very subjective, and we also don't know what they're going to do about open-source cryptocurrencies versus centrally controlled tokens like FTT of the FTX exchange, which could create real challenge. All right, that's all I have to say for today. And I'm going to leave with that advertisement for the next ADP event, uh, which is to be held on Thursday, February 23rd. Okay, thanks. Thank you so much, Vivian, for the wonderful yeah, presentation okay. on accounting for.